Rainer Hirsch, thank you for taking time to speak to the CASP. Uh, your performance of uh, Victor Borger is coming up on the 27th of May at the Ludlow Piano Festival. Could you please yeah. tell us, for those who don't know, who Victor Borger is and why, why have you decided to tell a story? Victor Borger was a pianist and a comedian who was huge in the 50s, 60s and 70s. He was actually at one point the highest paid entertainer in the world. He was famous in America, but actually he was born in Denmark. So uh, he became huge as this um, classical musician gone AWOL, basically. A pianist who appeared on the stage and entertained the audience principally with comedy. But mixed in there was music. Um, he toured every single concrete post in the ground. I mean, literally, uh, there isn't a single kind of English-speaking country he didn't visit. And most of the places... Uh, you know, in each of those countries. Um, and if you're of a certain generation, you would know Victor Borger. I'm interested in him because um, in 1996, I sort of accidentally wandered onto his turf, really. I I love classical music. I always have. I've always been a very keen pianist. And in 1996, I wrote a show called Class uh, All Classical Music Explained. And that, without knowing it, put me in his his domain. And I found, you know, that a lot of people referred to me in terms of Borg or referring to him. I was better than Borg, I was worse than Borg, or I was whatever. But it always had came back to Borg. And then um, I made a program for him, uh, my program for the BBC about him. And um, I decided, based on the interviews and so on, that I conducted that program to, to write a show, which is the show that I'm doing at Ludlow. International Piano Festival next Saturday. And can you tell us something interesting about his life? He's had quite an interesting life, hasn't he? He was he was born in Denmark. He had to flee the Nazis and get to the United States. What 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 resonates for you? Well, actually, what really resonated with me was that that story you just encapsulated. Then, I mean, he was massive, um, and his routines, you know, were quoted by presidents and tyrants. I mean. Uh, all that. But what really resonated with me was that story of his being a refugee. Um, because my father it escaped the Nazis too. That's how I got my name, Rainer Hirsch. Uh, my father wasn't Jewish, but his father was. And um, they came over, to cut a long story short, in 1939. Both of them, my father first, and then he managed to get his father over here. And that story of starting in a new country with pretty much nothing, as they both did, um, you know, that had a special you know, interest for me. Uh, the comedy and music part of it, well, that is, um, it's interesting to study someone else's career and someone else's material, and actually to the point of actually trying to deliver it also on stage. So in this performance, I'm not just strutting around as Victor Borger, I'm telling his story, I tell his story as me. So I'm having to do him, and he had this very peculiar accent, he was sort of Danish, and thought also American, you know, and uh, to me, Danish accent, this is to me a Danish accent. It is sort of cockney Scandinavian. This is how the Danish people speak. What I think of the Danish people, and then you have American accent, of course, any kind of American accent, you put them together and you end up with big tub bog. And this is the sort of voice that he had. Um, so studying someone else's routines, the you know, can I make this work again? Uh, that was all very interesting. So the core of it, was the story of the refugee. He came over to the US without speaking really much more than schoolboy English. And that's that was the story of my father as well. And then developing this huge career that he did. So I think nobody else will have a, a game, by the way. But, you know, in that field that I personally find so interesting, I think that, that's the combination that really got me and why I, dev I devoted time to writing and performing this show. I see. I, well, you, you, you're well known for being a musician. You're a professional conductor and a comedian. Uh, how, how, did, how did it happen? Can you can you give me an idea? Were you were you from a musical background? Where did you did you start off wanting to be a classical musician? Well, I started off. Uh, I suppose in my teens, I, I got absolutely obsessed by the piano. Um, my friend Alistair McGowan, who's organised this festival, the impressionist and. Uh, him generally all around good bloke. He's he's he 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 would appreciate this. He's become a slightly born again pianist, in fact. 
Uh, he studied it when he was a you know was a child, and then kind of gave up for a long period. But I I never gave up. I just got obsessed by it when I was in my teens, and um, I fell in love with certain music, and I just wanted to reproduce that music. So that was my that was a thing. Playing the piano, I spent an indecent amount of time in my teenage years playing the piano. But I knew at the same time that I never actually wanted to be a pianist. It is a very, very competitive world. And um, so there was that going on. And then similarly at un at um, at school, I got interested in comedy. The two parallel things, nothing, you know, quite two separate interests. The comedy was, you know, in the days of when Monty Python was being shown for the sort of second or third run on BBC Two, which it was. Friends of mine, we we started to get you know nerdily interested in it and found you know funny things in it and repeated the sketches to one another. And then uh, when I went to university, um, I joined a kind of review group thing, a sort of footlights thing, and started to write and perform sketches. So the music, the piano playing is going on all of it all this time. I'm playing, you know, the Chopin studies and the stuff that I wanted to play. And um, meantime. In the background, I'm doing my normal studies and I am taking part in a kind of theatrical group writing things and finding in that that I actually didn't mind being on a stage. I didn't mind standing there. And, you know, not to say I wasn't, you know, I was careless about it, but I found it was a thing that I, well, I, I could do. And when I left university, one of the, my first jobs, I worked in uh, the Edinburgh Festival, in the International Festival. There are two festivals in Edinburgh, people don't always appreciate there's in the International Festival, which is um, great orchestras and Miss Julie being performed in Swedish and goodness knows what else. And I, when I was working, there, I found that there were people who are uh, actually from the London comedy circuit performing in fringe shows, which I went to see. And I was completely bowled over by these fringe shows. And I realised there's this kind of comedy circuit in London. Um, that experience of writing and performing at university, I thought, well, I, I'd like to try and do that. So I started performing on the London comedy circuit not a word about music by the way I mean that's still going away in the background I'm still playing the piano I'm still you know giving the odd lunchtime concert the that kind of thing um and that stand-up comedy thing grew into a sort of second career so I'm working with my music you know administration thing basically I was working for orchestras and following my love of music but not as a performer and and you, sorry, you you studied economics at university. Does that does that mean that some before before going to university you, you want to be an economist or did you did you didn't really see comedy or music as a as a viable career for yourself? Well, I no, yeah, I mean, yeah, I brushed over that bit because you know I did rather bizarrely do economics, and the reason for that was in my evangelism for you know music as a teenager. I organized concerts actually at my at school. I organized two recitals by a pianist called Barry Douglas, who subsequently went on and won the Tchaikovsky piano competition. So um, he and I became friends way back when, when I was a spotty teenager. And somebody said to me, you you know that thing you're doing when you're organizing, you should, you should do this as a job, you should become a promoter or something. And the only kind of subject which I thought was very even close to that was economics, um, which is what I was studying as a, at an A-level. Um, I now realise that was complete and absolute rubbish. I mean, promoting is, it, economics is about grand movements in, you know, in, in you know, money and, and interest rates and so on. And and what, what you do when you're promoting is pretty much, you know, it's a business job. It's not nothing related. But anyway, that's why I did economics. I chose economics. What a waste of time that turned out to be. I think the only thing it really chose taught me actually was what it means to get down to study something you're really not that interested in, really. And we, you know, you have to at points in your life, you have to um, you have to knuckle down to things that aren't necessarily that interesting to you. And that's what it taught me. I know I passed the degree, and I remember one of my tutors saying, "Listen, you know what you want to do." He knew exactly my story up to that point. He wanted I wanted to get in music, volume music, music don't flunk this degree just pass the thing and move on which is kind of what i did i passed it well but that was a line i drew um on in my life the moment i got from my last final uh, of economics and i haven't thought about it since and it's a it's a it's a it's a it's an entertainment to my wife that i actually studied economics and i think it's an entertainment to most people that know me um so that was that yeah but i always joke you know suffice to say if 
somebody told me I only had six months to live. I go back to Lancaster University and do another degree in economics because in doing that six months would seem like an absolute eternity. Um, yeah, so that was it. I did the university and I started working in music and then I um, decided to write a show. I, I basically did the, the comedy, which is, you know, just stand up comedy, basically, for, for the while. And, and, and no music involved at this stage. Yeah, well, there was no music initially for the first five years. It was just me and flying and, you know, the girlfriend that theoretically left me and all the stuff, politics. Why don't they make the plane out of the same stuff they made the black bucks out of? What's that out of that? Me and my girlfriend argue, you know, what's say about couples after the worst arguments have the best sex. Me and her works the other way around. around. We have terrible sex followed by fantastic arguments. All that stuff. <laughs> um, in clubs, you know, if you've ever been to a comedy club, that was me up there with a the microphone doing that. And then um, when I was 30, so, you know, I've been doing the comedy for about five years as a kind of hobby, parallel with the actual career in music, the working for orchestras. My last job where I went into an office was called Touring Manager of the London Festival Orchestra. And I did that for three years. Um, so that was international touring where I used to waltz around with a big bow tie and cigar, you know, organising the musicians. And... Um, then having done the comedy for a while, I thought, I, you know, I, I actually want to see what it would be like if I actually gave it all. I actually tried to do this full time. I didn't want to be somebody who thought, you know, what would it have been like if I'd done that? So I, at the age of 30, I devoted myself entirely. I gave up. I walked into the office and said, you know, I'm going to do that comedy thing full time. They kind of guessed it anyway, because I actually used to take my summer holiday and go to Edinburgh, do an Edinburgh show. Um, and that's when I started doing music full time. And then, then, then there was still another... Oh, four or five years of, you know, flying and sex and politics. But then Edinburgh came along and I decided I was going to write a show about music, which is what I actually am interested in. And that's Sorry, when... sorry, I need to stop you. When did you when did you train as a conductor? Is, this is uh, well, you're not... get back in time again. We haven't quite got to that bit. So I'm playing. Ah. I, I didn't do that till later. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a pianist, really. That's where I started. But a lot of conductors start like that. You know, I play the piano and I accompany people. But I, um, having written that show about classical music and realised this is my kind of voice. This is what I should have been talking about all the time because it's something that I know and love. And I think people kind of recognise that, even if you're being utterly glib about it and, par you know, whatever you want. I don't know, Mozart wrote his first symphony when it was four years old. It's rubbish, that symphony in half of it. It's in crayon. I mean, if you write, if you, if you, you people recognise that this comes from some sort of knowledge and you sit down and play the piano a bit. Um, and then that, so I did that show and that got on radio and telly. And then the next year, obviously, I thought I hadn't lost enough money the first year in Edinburgh. I mean, that was my still. I've done the Edinburgh 13 times. So I've, I've poured money into the Edinburgh economy. I added musicians. I added musicians to that show. Uh, the next year, I thought some of the musicians could, musicians could play the, some of these gags. So I, I added musicians, a little seven piece kind of ensemble. And, and I started arranging the music and I conducted, I had to conduct them basically, because I have to give myself something to do on the stage when they're playing. And that is when, that's when the, con the conducting started really. So people basically, I, I'm conducting these seven piece players. It, it's now grown into nine actually. We've added a pianist and a bass player to that original lineup. And then people said, you know that thing you do with that little orchestra, you know, could you do, do that with our actual orchestra? <laughs> Can you come and conduct it? The first people that said that actually were, and they might sound a bit, a bit obscure, but they're quite a big name down under, the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra. And uh, I did, I went, I went, I think, with a show to, to, what it, to Adelaide Festival. I did three weeks at Adelaide Festival doing a comedy and classical music show. And one night, the audience was basically the entirety of the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra who were actually giving a concert at the proper festival. And um, somebody contacted me and said, listen, could you, is there any way you could do, you can convert what you're doing as a kind of stand-up and with your little orchestra into um, a big orchestra? And could you come and conduct us and do a show? So I, I went over there, it was 2001, that was the first time I did it. And the first time I kind of had didn't have any real idea what the hell I was doing conducting. I mean, I kind of knew the basics, how to start them and how to stop them and stuff. Um, but at this point, um, if I par paraphrase it into the people I'm working are not my friends. I mean, I'll say they're not their enemies, but obviously with my little orchestra, the one I'd done in, in Edinburgh, I could get away with anything because, you know, there's only nine of them. But when you're facing an orchestra of 70, 
you really need to know something of a kind of stick technique. You need to know what these gestures are, how to how to convey what you need to convey in a short time, because rehearsal is very, very short in those situations. So then I started studying and conducting and to cut a long, I did it privately at first, you know, that's to say one-on-one -on -one lessons with teachers. And then I found a course at Blackheath Conservatory, which might sound again like a bit of an obscure seat of learning, but uh, there was a woman there called Denise Ham, who uh, is a very noted, much noted uh, conducting teacher. And I did three years of a course with her, um, which is a group which has, uh, not every day, it was uh, three terms a year, um, six lessons a term, once, you know, once every two weeks, basically, we met. And that is where I really learned how to conduct. And then I basically also did carried, I did master classes at the Royal Academy of Music. And so that's pretty good grounding. And then after that, pretty soon after that, I actually conducted the Johann Strauss Orchestra for four years, doing a Johann Strauss show tour around Britain, we used to do a tour. And for that, I stu I studied in Vienna every every year for four years, not every, all for four years continuously, but I used to go to Vienna and study with a conductor there. So that's, those are my, conduct those are my conducting chops. Um, by that time, you know, I've not just done comedy conducting, I've conducted, you know, most of the Beethoven symphonies and grand works like La Mer of Debussy and all that stuff. Um, and I brought it all back to still working with my little orchestra. But, you know, when I when people when I conduct other people's orchestras as a guest, which happens still quite frequently, um, you know, I'm going to Canada this year and you know, Germany and all those places like that. And I, I basically get, you know, a short time to work with the orchestra. To, to I have my scores. I'm not, I'm not doing the Beethoven symphonies that kind of not that it doesn't interest me, but there are plenty of other people that can do that. But when I'm standing there with the orchestra, I know that what I'm doing is is recognizable by them. And I know the discipline. I'm, you know, I speak their language in terms of you know, the music and the gestures. And um, yeah, so they're not thinking, oh, it's just a comedian turned up to wave his hands around and you know, look like a conductor. I actually know what I'm doing. So that's that's that. And I also, I mean, I also um I talk about conducting quite a lot. Um, for example, this week. I have uh, I have a, a module for business people about conducting, about what conducting, how the orchestra works and how that can relate to large organisations. Um, in other words, you know, the role of the conductor is this mystery people don't understand. And people find that the analogy of orchestras um, against as against their business, you know, works very well. And that's a it's a very effective kind of tool and it's something I do. I'm doing twice this week with once at Nottingham University with some musicians and once with a bigger orchestra, at, you know, in the O2 this week. So that has become a thing. Just talking about conducting as someone who can look at the audience in the eye and be, you know, entertaining with it as well as impart information has become a part of my life. Was there, was there a time where you realize this was going to work as a career where you realize it's all come together and it was actually going to work out as a, as a career um and there's no one time that kind of penny drops really i mean people like to kind of people like to create a sort of backstory for you <laughs> and they think they like to create that for borger as well i mean getting back to the borger story victor borger this guy he he was uh he was a he was a very good pianist but he wasn't going to be a concert pianist he he was uh, you know he could he what his skill was was combining his ability to look the audience in the eye and be entertaining with them with this you know skill as a pianist pianist but um people used to you know I've heard so many myths about him you know there was one concert where you know the orchestra they they made somebody made a mistake and he turned he decided to make a joke about it and, you know, look the audience in the eye. And this is the moment when he began his career. And, you know, he somehow, he, this is, you know, uh, enlightening moment. It's not like that. You gradually work your way towards it. In his case, you know, he started as a pianist. He ended up as a kind of almost a mus MD, musical director in shows. And then, you know, he gradually percolated onto the stage himself and did routines and that. And then he got another spot doing this, another spot doing that. And eventually he found that, actually, you know, this is what he's, he was his true talent was which was combining the skills and he took him 10 years 
in the same part, in the same way for me, I mean, I started, I suppose, these two things that I described, the comedy and the music, they carried on together. At a certain point, um, you know, I, I started doing the comedy full time. And then at some point I thought, well, I, you know, I'm going to write a show about music. And I think there was a bit of an enlightenment then because I thought, you know, this is actually something that I really do enjoy. And people recognize that in me as something that I can do and, and tell them. And then and gradually uh, you realize that this is your thing. It happens. It dawns on you kind of slowly over years almost. I think in terms of the, you know, earning and money, earning money and earning a, having a career out of it. When I gave up my job when I was 30, um, which was a kind of a good successful job, I could have gone on to other orchestras and done other things in music management. I think I I give myself three years. I think I thought that's what I thought. But then I, I pretty much now realise in hindsight, after about three months, you completely burn your boat. Uh, you have committed to this thing. Because, I mean, imagine yourself sitting in that interview and they say, what have you been doing for the last, you know, three years? I've been on a stage mouthing off, basically, swearing quite a lot at the comedy store in London. And they go, well, do you fit into a team? Well, no, I don't fit into a team anymore. I am kind of... I'm used to being my a team of one and um, you can't go back really. So I suppose there's a kind of little bit with hindsight, you realize actually you have completely trashed any chance you had of any other career. And so you might as well drive forward with this one. Um, but it's been, you know, it's been fine. You know, 30 years later, 31 years later, I'm still doing it. I think there was a, probably a moment during COVID when you, when, when one had your reflections about whether this was actually, I was going to be able to carry on. I think that's pretty much true of every performer who was out of, out of work, really. I lost their job, effectively, for two years. I would say three, in fact. That's what it took. And that was a moment of, you know, looking back and thinking, what the hell happened there? And have I got any skills that I could apply? My mother said at the time, you know, well, you could join a bank, and except you haven't got the qualifications. And I said, actually, I've got a degree in economics. I have got the qualifications. <laughs> but... It happens very gradually. And it's like everybody look back at your story and you think, well, there's no one moment you think I'm going to do this. It kind of dawns on you a little bit. You follow lines and um, that's what I've done. So looking back, what's the one one piece you think you said you encourage everyone to go and watch? What, if, what, if, what are you most proud of, I guess? Uh, well... I've had a lot of sort of, um, um, when you do a career like this, you, you know, you have the pleasure of doing some pretty extraordinary things and meeting extraordinary people, really. I won't, you know, embarrass myself by mentioning those, but, you know, um, and that, you know, the things that you've done is incredible. We don't mind that. You, you could tell us if you want. <laughs> well, last last week, I, was, I went to a small gathering with Sting, Bob Geldorf, uh, Terry Gillingham, and then and then two days later, I was in Berlin meeting, you know, some friends of mine who are also big names in Germany. So you know that the, you to, to meet those people and do those things and to see the places you've seen, it thing it is pretty amazing. I mean, it, you must look back at that. And go, well, listen, whatever else happened, I had that chance, and that's great. But I think if I turn up thinking thinking about one, you know, thing, I, I in two thousand and nine, having done you know the comedy and the music and the orchestra thing and the conducting for a bit. I put on a concert at the festival hall. Um, you know, you do it for, for comic relief, actually. And it was with the Philharmonia Orchestra. And the guests included Alfred Brendel. If anybody knows their pianism, will know Alfred Brendel, one of the great, great giants of, you know, piano playing of all time, I think, and certainly in the last century. Um, uh, Evelyn Glenny, the percussionist, Nicola Benedetti, a few others. And... Um, yeah, that was a show that I produced, wrote, did, and, you know, posted all the way through. And uh, it was, you know, recorded and put out by the BBC. And I, I think that's a moment when I look back and I think, okay, that was a kind of a very special time when first thing, that that thing came together. And um, I, I one of the things, the strange things, that I mean, the BBC recorded it and, you know, um, one of the, the YouTube videos I had, which is a routine that I did in that show, it's called the Windows Waltz, which is basically I realized, you know, this is back in the noughties. You know, I was listening to my Windows XP computer and it's making all these sounds. I think, well, I could I could probably orchestrate these sounds. So I kind of I basically made them for the orchestra to play. That kind of sound. You know, those kind of sounds that XP used to make. Now, now it's sort of I think all computers have stopped being quite so musical. 
and I put them together into a waltz and I and I you know I did that as part of the show at the festival hall and uh, that went out as a YouTube video which has now got 30 million views I think on YouTube so I think if anyone knows me they might know me from that but that obviously was a bit of a something a spin-off for this actual show so I think that's something I'm I, I look back on and I think when I'm dribbling you know into my um into my bib uh in uh, in my dotage with you know packet of Werther's originals in one hand and what are the TV remote control and the other, I will think about that as being um, a great moment. I mean, part of anything, I met Avril Brendel, I had a long chat with him. And um, Avril Brendel is pianist who I've got, you know, un endless recordings from. I had a box set of him playing the complete Beethoven piano works. He recorded he recorded every single dot that most of Beethoven wrote. And I've got this box set. And I had the kind of the... the the, the kind of booklet that came with me. I took it there with the concert because I thought, right, I'm never going to meet Avram Brennan again. And it, we were in, we were in next, I mean, it was my gig basically. And he was my sort of comedy um, assistant for that, for that day. And I went and I long chat with him. He signed the thing and he dated it. And that's a very special little memento. And that's what I mean. You get these chances to do these pretty incredible things and you can't knock that. So whatever else happens, you know, I did meet Avram Brendel for a while and, and had a great time. I can't think of any professional conductors and musicians who are doing comedy at the same time. I know people who do music and comedy. Who's going to follow in your footsteps in the future? Well, of course, there'll be somebody else. I think, um, well, you know, I, I say that. I have to say, what I am doing with the orchestra is I'm taking well-known pieces of classical music. And if you think, oh, I wouldn't get these, I wouldn't get these jokes, you will get the jokes. The whole point of it is to be written so that people get, it's not stupid, I don't think. I think it's it starts from what people recognise, which is, you know, everybody recognises 20 pieces of classical music. They might not know the names. You know, everybody knows those names, those pieces of music. Ba -ba -ba -ba. And... It, we kind of corrupt them. So we play pieces which are rearranged, or we play, I play pieces which are rearranged, and I've done all the arrangements, and uh, there are jokes cut into them. And what kind of jokes are those? Well, I'm afraid to say you have to listen to it. If you go on YouTube and look up my name, you'll find some examples of that. Um, and I know that other people have used the orchestra. I mean, for example, Victor Borger did a show with orchestra, but he, he didn't rearrange the music. He didn't do that. I and mean, he it was him out front pretty much. And he, you know, he did routines with the orchestra where the orchestra uh, played the, the music straight, but he did kind of did funny things uh, alongside in order to kind of to aid and abet it. But he didn't get his hands dirty with you know, actually rearranging the music. And that, there's a good reason for that. It's that it is incredibly time consuming. I mean, it is, it's like a super tank of the orchestra. And if you're trying to make gags with them for them to do, Every, every single gesture takes, you know, a week pretty much. And if it goes wrong as a stand-up, you write, write a joke and it doesn't work as a stand-up, you just go back into the green room and rewrite it. If you if you something doesn't quite work with the orchestra, you think, ah, oh, that could be shorter, that could be quicker, that needs to be more obvious, that needs to whatever, that doesn't work. You, you know, you have to go literally, you know, not back to, back to your work room and there's another three days' work to make the thing happen. So the... Um, I think I don't think anybody, and I can honestly say this because I've studied the I've studied the field. I've done pro, you know a series for the BBC about it. I don't think anybody's actually done this before. There are a bit, there's 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 a guy called Peter Schickele who's created a character called BD PDQ Bach, and PDQ Bach was original compositions in a kind of baroque style with gags in them. But um, that's kind of close-ish it to it. So who's going to follow? Well, you know there'll be up there are other people out there doing their own thing. I mean, what you're always aiming for as a as a comedian is to find your kind of voice and your individual way forward. And I'm I feel happy that this by this devious method, or, you know, this odd route that I described to you, that I have ended up in this place doing something that I don't think anybody has done before. Um, and also, you know, that a conductor, somebody who's actually has got conducting skills. You know, I, I've conducted my way through hundreds of orchestras you know that somebody combines those skills with with the intention merely of perverting it and making it into something you know com comic and and you know bringing all that that effort to, to kind of chuck it away sort of thing to drive it into a hedge 
but um, not chuck it away, but provide another kind of use it in another way. So whether anybody prepared to go through all of that, I don't know. But I feel, you know, other people out there, they will they will do they will find their own method and find something else to do with it. You know. OK, I'm distinctly aware of how much of your time I'm taking. I just want to quickly ask you, other than Monty Python, about your comedy influences. My comedy here, my comedy influences, did you say? Yes. Um, well, when I was, I, I, I mean, when I was grow, growing up as a stand up, you know, that is to say, um, my late 20s and early 30s, when I really, you know, was focusing a lot on that and not on kind of, you're looking for influence, you're looking for, you know, who you are looking for influences, I suppose. I think I, I value sort of, intellectual comedy if I might say that uh, like Bill Hicks was a great influence, he's an American comedian who's he's been 30 years dead Bill Hicks, he died in his very very young pancreatic cancer but he was the person that we all listened to back then and that sort of comedy um, which uses ideas and is kind of has is, is you know um explores kind of uh comedically uh issues essentially i always like i'm I, it's strange because that's not what i'm doing but i think i've got that sort of uh i think people always say what i'm doing it's not altogether it's not when i say it's uncomfortable if i say uh, you know, it's not comfortable is to say that I, it's a, it i'm sort of uh i think probably there's a bit of a, a little bit rage about you know about my the things i don't like about music um coming there uh, and may, being, you know, a bit satirical about the orchestra and about the situation, because I think it, a lot of classical music is a bit absurd, really. There are these kind of formalities that we have to go through, uh, that, you know, that the conductor comes on and shakes the conductor, the, the, the orchestra's hand. Why the hell are they doing that? Because, you know, surely they've met these people. <laughs> you know, this whole formality of the thing. I mean, and it, when I, when I, so I, I'm looking for those little cracks in you know in 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 the procedure and, and what what goes on and i think that's probably what i admire about the comedians i like apart from that you know i've got a lot of friends on the on the comedy circuit whose names you wouldn't necessarily know who 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 I, again i grew up with you know if you're doing seven shows a week you know in the comedy clubs you you the comedians see most of are your colleagues really and you learn from them, really. Uh, you learn from them, you know, when you learn from the audience. Um, so those are my influences, I suppose, uh, over time. And now uh, I kind of, I actually, to be honest, I don't watch that much comedy. I think the problem is because you know when you're looking at comedy, you don't, uh, you know, you when you're when you're when you're in a little corner like this doing your own thing, there's nobody but you. So you're kind of trying to find ways to explore what you do in, you know, to expand the envelope somewhat so you don't watch much comedy these days yeah i mean there's a lot of it not a, a lot of it the, yeah there was much more than you know when i was when i was sort of you know in my 20s 30s or when i was at school it was pretty much you know bbc too that was it you know there was there was not the explosion there is these days but i mean um I, okay from time to time i watch you know live at the apollo for example just to remind myself, you know, what that's what is stand up to doing now and what it means to be a stand up, because, you know, I, I, I still stand up. I still look at the audience and I just tell them, tell them jokes, but in this very this organized, this other context. But there's no one person I, I think, oh, you know, I really got to go and see this show or go and see that show. These days, I, I probably prefer to go to concerts and use that as kind of, you know, classical concerts or other concerts that to use that as a kind of springboard to think about new ideas and to inspire me. Actually, in I just went, I was in Berlin over the weekend, he says, dropping another thing. <laughs> I went to see the Gypsy Kings. I mean, I don't know who'd have thunk thunk that I'd be going to see the Jink Gypsy Kings. I just found that energy that they've got interesting and 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 you know the vibe and the audience's reaction to it. Um and it made did me enjoy think, it. I did enjoy it. I mean, one of the things what which, 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 which of course I've slightly forgotten. If you go and see the Gypsy Kings, you don't get 100% of the Gypsy Kings. Somebody comes on, you know, the, the, the lights dim, and, and a support act comes on. A guy comes on with a guitar and sings songs for his own songs, which you weren't expecting. And I just thought, I thought to myself, well, what would it be like if, if, if a classical concert? You went to see the St. Petersburg, you know, Philharmonic Orchestra or whatever, and the lights dim, and on comes a pianist and plays for half an hour. And I just thought, that's the sort of idea. That's why I mean, that's why I think those, those, 
that's what influences me and that's what inspires me and i just i'm sitting there thinking this um you know uh maybe maybe that's something we we could do um i'm just i'm th- I, mean, I find it a little bit odd i found the other i went to another concert actually also in berlin a string quartet and uh in a venue that I then play, I'm going to do a gig in myself in December. And I'm just thinking, why are we clapping? What is this clapping thing? What's that about? Why has that become our recognised way of, you know, acknowledging it? Why isn't it sort of making some other noise? And the bowing bit, what do people bow? What's the, what's the bow thing? And we're not Japanese, but this bowing has t- 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 come into life as a way of, you know, the clapping, we clap and they bow and they clap and bow and we clap. And I just thought, I'm just thinking just that's extremely odd, but wh- where that'll end up, I don't know. But, you know, it, it'll end up somewhere, I suppose, you know, the idea of different styles of clapping, different styles of bowing, you know, Japanese bow, very formal, uh, you know, <laughs> magical bow could be, you know, that there's whatever it is, you know, uh, Indian, you know, maybe I don't know what it is. So I don't. Uh, th- that's what I find inspiring. That you know, just watching people perform in whatever form. That's what I. That's what interests me. A- any projects uh, you're working on currently? Like tell us about uh, what should we look forward to from you in the near future? Well, I I am started a book and I need to finish it about conducting, um, which uh, will be finished. You know, I've got a very busy period at the moment. Um, just well with this with the Borger show which I haven't done for a while um, and it was a massive relearn but Alistair has asked me to relearn it and I'm doing that and um, I have these corporate things I'm doing and other performances I'm going to Canada with an orchestra and so on but the book will be finished the book is about conducting because uh, you know what the hell does a conductor do basically is what it answers I hope in ways that you know this pretty is under, easy to understand um, it's called actually I'm going to say this word now it's called F all about conducting well I, I would expand that word but you know there are there are people all ages listening F all about conducting and uh, the reason why it's called that is because based on the story apocryphal I'm sure but um, told by all musicians about the uh, foreign conductor the conductor for whom English is not a first language holding a rehearsal with a British orchestra and the orchestra is messing about. They're playing, you know, they're playing their cues wrong. They are putting their hands up and asking questions and stopping the rehearsal. And eventually the non-English speaking conductor loses his or her temper, throws the baton down and says, I know what you're doing. You think I know fuck nothing, but you are wrong. I know fuck all. So it's a story, that, that story. And by the way, it's, it, 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 it's been told by actors as well. So, but anyway, that's that book. Um, I also have a show planned about the ring cycle, which I'd like to do um, probably for um, Edinburgh 2024. Um, yeah, I think that's a subject that needs vi- revisiting. And meantime, you know, I'm always working on new things for... The orchestra there's i've got a, a load of youtube videos which need to be released got together and released um i just did a concert on the first of april april fool's day at cadogan horn in london where lots of things were recorded uh, there's a history of music basically routine in that um there is oh opera translated routines there's there's a few others so um i'll return to the youtube channel which you know for me has been a a big success. I think 70 million, 80 million people watch that YouTube channel. Uh, but, you know, whereas um, a lot of YouTube is how to videos, you know, if you want to, you want to fix your blind to the wall or whatever you think, you know, I'll, I'll look up a YouTube video. That's what majority of YouTube is. And they try to encourage you to do something crazy, like release a video a week. But actually when your videos involve orchestras and audiences and all the rest of it that is actually impossible youtube is very keen on sort of people producing content um so it goes in waves with me youtube and um then when i have time you know more videos get edited together of recordings i've I've got and we advance i mean for example the the coronation and the coronation a fame a piece that reached great uh, you know had a great deal of penetration was zadok the priest which is the coronation anthem played at every coronation since 17 you know, something or other when Handel been done and wrote it. Um, yeah, and I've got a translation of that, you know, um, Zadok got pissed, Zadok got pissed and peed on the carpet. And I know a song about it. Um, so that'll go out at some point. Um, 
yeah so you know there's always something to be doing um and i'm i'm working on all those things at the same time while still playing the piano and lately by the way also a grand hobby of mine is playing the viola which i do very badly in other people's orchestras when you know i'm um, sure not <laughs> surely not i can't count i can't play rhythms i can't do anything but i i enjoy it greatly i i took that up about six or seven years ago to find out what it was like to play in an orchestra and not only just conduct one and i find that i'm pretty bad at it <laughs> where's the best place to find out about what's happening uh, is, is is it uh rainerhirsch.com is that is it that is, is that where that is radiohost.com and um uh the youtube channel exists partly on that but mainly it exists on the youtube and um but radiohost.com is where you know things come up see a lot of my things also they're not public events unfortunately so uh ten what tends to happen on on youtube on website is the kind of public events you know i think oh my god he's not he's, he's given up but actually uh there's kind of very few things that it is you know that i I'm able to put on there um but you know things like the youtube they're obviously publicly available and the bigger concerts and stuff i mean the trouble is the concerts also tend to be around you know a lot of them in germany uh for example and um you know these canada things with the Can calgary symphony orchestra calgary philharmonic and um yeah it gets a bit spread around so but that is you know where i put out news and there's a newsletter and all that kind of stuff right right now okay thank you very much indeed for speaking to us not at all. Thank you.